Welcome back to Retrobytes. I love collecting old hardware, but besides sitting around and looking pretty, they're relatively useless these days. But do they have to be? If you have a sudden desire to play some classic PC titles, retro laptops can be a great choice, but not a necessity. Services like GOG have made it so that you can play classic games on your modern hardware. If you're watching this channel and haven't checked out GOG yet, give them a look. So classic gaming on modern hardware is easily achievable, but what about modern gaming on obsolete hardware? Who would even want to do this? Unjustifiable rhetorical questions aside, is it even possible? Well that's why I'm here, to answer questions that nobody is asking. So to pull this off we'll need a victim, um, a specimen. I'll be using this old laptop. It's the Gateway MA7 from 2012. While most wouldn't consider a laptop from 2012 to be obsolete, I can assure you this laptop was obsolete when it was new. Components like the CPU, RAM, and hard drive were already five years old when this was released. And while the label might say Gateway, make no mistake this is an Acer, who at the time was making some of the cheapest plastic garbage you'd ever seen. Funnily enough, Acer bought Gateway in 2007 to use it as their budget brand. So this is budget garbage? I'd believe it. Acer was basically selling brand new five-year-old laptops. Now, neither company seems to acknowledge that the MA7 ever existed, as evidenced by the absence of the model on both brand support pages. The MA7, however, does exist. It's powered by a then five-year-old Intel Core 2 64-bit mobile CPU clocked at 1.6 gigahertz. Two gigabytes of DDR2 RAM, even though DDR3 was released five years prior to this laptop, and a 160 gigabyte 5400 RPM hard drive and integrated graphics. Overall though, this specimen is in pretty good shape, uh, just missing a key on the keyboard. The fit and finish on this laptop is very nice though, with a pleasant faux brushed aluminum wrist rest which kind of morph into trim outlining the vast exhaust port on the left and the vast array of ports on the right, including a modem jack which serves nothing more these days than to date the machine. One of my favorite design choices was to place the port labels above the ports where the user can see them. Well done Acer um, Gateway. An illuminated ring surrounds the power button, and the system status indicators shine through this glossy cover below the comically small touchpad. But a capable machine, this is not. I can't even play Minecraft on this laptop without turning the graphical settings all the way down. And even then I'm still subjected to severe stutters and single digit frame rates. So how then do I plan on pulling this off? Enter Steam in-home streaming. This laptop shipped with Windows Vista pre-installed, but Steam dropped support for Vista in XP January 1st, 2019, and I have no intention of subjecting myself to 10 minute boot times with Windows 10, um, so I turned to Linux. Linux is great for being, bringing usefulness back to obsolete technology. After this video, check out how I got Minecraft server running on a pair of 200 megahertz Pentium Pro CPUs. Uh, now, let's talk about network connections. Steam relies heavily on network performance, and I would undoubtedly get better performance if I'd used Ethernet, but I want this to be portable. So today I'll be testing with 5 GHz wireless. If you decide to try this out for yourself on an old desktop, by all means use Ethernet and reap the benefits. Finally, to ensure the test results solely reflect the performance of the Gateway laptop, I'll be hosting the games on this very capable Ryzen 7 system. Alright, let's jump into it. The following gameplay was recorded in real time. Uh, the host is on the left and the Gateway laptop is on the right.
So just as a reminder, here's how Minecraft performed running natively on the gateway. So I noticed that the Steam streaming client will crash whenever the resolution of the game changes, like at the very beginning of GTA 5. You can restart the Steam client and rejoin the stream, however. So, artifacts and latency are a big issue, as you can see. Both of these would be less of an issue if I used a solid Ethernet connection. Steve even lets you know that your wireless network is causing issues with a flashing red Wi-Fi icon. Perhaps an upgraded wireless adapter is in order here. So, color me impressed. This whole project is really only possible due to the combined efforts of the folks at Steam who built a great in-home streaming product, and the folks working on Linux and Ubuntu who make it possible to run their modern operating system on obsolete hardware like this gateway. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Retrobytes. Take care.